Hello and welcome to World Insight Special Program Way Into Sessions. I'm Tian Wei. China aims to expand its economy by over 6% in 2021, building on strong tailwinds from successfully containing COVID-19. On the sidelines of China's annual political season, Justin Li Fulin, CPPCC Standing Committee member, shares his views about the GDP target and how will China be able to reduce its budget deficit. Professor Lin, 6% GDP target. People didn't expect that China would set the GDP target, but China did this time, and 6%. Interesting, many say. I think the target is 6% or more. And because China is recovery from the hit of COVID-19, and I think that you know, China has the potential to grow at six or even more for 2021. However, Professor Lian, many suspect whether there will be huge pressure on the Chinese economy because of the ever-increasing complicated geopolitics and also the uh, further impact of the pandemic elsewhere in the world. Uh, and uh, certainly every country during their economic development, they are going to meet you know, this challenge or the challenges. However, overall, the global economy is recovering. And it's expected not only in China, but also in Europe and in the US. So although there's some uncertainty there, but the chance for the global recovery is high. And not only so, China is a large economy. Domestic, domestic circulation is the main body of China's economy. And uh, so, you know, with the control of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think uh, China will rebound domestically as well. And as long as we can maintain a healthy growth domestically, I think China will do much better than 2020. One of the things people are looking at China is the budget deficit. Uh, now the number is about 3.5 uh, to 3.6 percent. Now, according to the plan for 2021, decreased to about 3.2 percent. You know, these are numbers that economists are extremely interested in. Could you help us to uh, help our audience to understand what is the significance of this 0.4%? Where would that come from? Certainly now we try to reduce a little bit of the government debt because in 2020 to offset the shock from the pandemic, the government need to support the in our household, and the government also need to support the private sectors, and as so China increased the government debt. But with the recovering, we certainly should reduce the stimulus. However, we need to maintain the continuity of the macro policies, because some project that was carried out in 2020s, we need to complete that, and we cannot, you know, cut all the support to that. And so I think that the 3.2 percent government debt is a realistic measurement, considering the need to reduce the debt, but at the same time to maintain macro policy continuity. Many worry at local level, for example, local government's level, whether the debt has been really building up to a certain extent. Regarding the local government debt, certainly we need to pay attention to that. But if you consider the debt level in China, with you know, the comparison to other countries, the debt level in China is that it's not that high. Not only so, most of the government debt in a local level were used for investment in infrastructure, you know, in supporting the better environment and so on. 
those kind of investments, they actually build up some asset. And those assets are valuable and can generate the revenues. So if you consider those asset size of the government debt, the net debt is actually much lower than the gross figure indicate. But by saying so, I do not mean mm -hmm. we should you know, not pay attention to the sustainability of that. But so far, I think the situation in China is sustainable. What do you mean by sustainable? Because the growth in China will continue. Once you have the growth, then the government revenue will be increased. At the same time, the GDP will also be increased and both will contribute to the decline mm. of the debt level. And that make the debt in China mm. uh, much more sustainable comparing to other countries if they, they use the debt to support consumption and so on. Well, Professor Lin, that certainly makes sense. But many wonder whether the money is really used to do what you consider as really important infrastructure building. Because as uh, PBOC uh, official Guo Shuqing earlier talked about the bubble in the housing market, there seems to be still a lot of money putting into the real estate sector, which is likely to bring more vulnerability to the Chinese economy. So, Professor Lian, uh, what is the real picture here? I think those kind of housing and so on, that's a private debt. And then we are just, you know, we discuss the public debt. And if certainly the private debt, we also right. need to pay attention to. The housing prices you know, in China are quite high. Not only it may you know, embody certain bubble there, and if bubble burst, certainly it will be a shock to the households as well as to the financial you know, sectors. So we need to pay attention to that. Uh, 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 but we should not you know, mix with the private sector's debt with the public sector debts. And for the private sector debt, mm. you know, the high housing prices, not only it can be a bubble, but it also will become a burden on the household, especially for the younger generation. When they you know, graduate from the university, they started to work. And uh, because it's a Chinese custom, everyone wants to have a house. And when they face such a high housing prices, then they feel, you know, hard to overcome and, uh, you know, they feel frustrated. So there's a need for China to pay attention to the rise of housing prices and uh, to, you know, gradually, you know, reduce it. And uh, then with the rise of the income, with the rise of the economy, gradually there will be, you know, more affordable and uh, more sustainable. Professor Lin, there's a lot of talk about the green economy for the China's 14th five-year plan. You were also participating in the uh, process of uh, uh, drawing up the plan. How is that green economy likely to transform the current economic structure China has? I think that's a very important commitment from the Chinese government. And uh, as you know, the uh, presidency propose, proposes the new development ideas and in this development ideas, green growth is one of the key element. And that means we need to rely on green technology, green energies, and we need to have a green transformation in order to you know, reduce the CO2 emission. And so we can you know, have this you know, carbon neutrality in 2060, and we will hit the height Mm -hmm. of carbon emission in 2030s. And those kind of transformation is a commitment from China to the Chinese people and also to the world. And certainly that means we need to work hard in terms of the green innovation, to make the technology available to the Chinese people, to the Chinese firm. And as you know, that we you know develop a lot in the renewable energy, solar energy, wind energy. At the same time, we propose to you know, reduce the emission in the factories, 
and we also, you know, use the gas to re to replace coal as the source of you know household energy consumption and so on. I think that all those add up will make the Chinese growth with a much higher quality, especially in terms of green and uh, you know sustainability. Professor Lin, there's a lot of new developments such as. Uh you know, green bond and also carbon trading. When we think about that transformation, how is it going to take place? And how is it going to proceed as we speak? Once we know this is what we desire, then both the government and the, 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 the whole communities will work together to achieve the target. And in terms of the green, mm. we know that we need to use the new technology. And uh, it's an opportunity for China also, because once we determine to develop green growth, then the green industry, green technology become a new pause of growth in China. And uh, their growth will provide right. the technology, provide the new format for the household as well as the older economy to you know, have a better technology to replace the older technology. And so by that, we do see it's a challenges, but also an opportunity. What do you consider as the biggest challenges for Chinese economy this year and in the very near future years, and the largest dividend or dividends that China could still enjoy? Well, I think each year is, has its new challenges. And uh, for this year, certainly, right. we need to have a smooth transition from the pandemic more to the normal more. Just we talk about the cutting down of the debt level of the government. And uh, certainly, we need to do some adjustment of that. And uh, secondly, you know, because the income in China continue to grow, and then certainly we need to find new poles of growth, new drivers of the growth. And we need to rely on innovations for the growth. And as you know, innovation always means risk. And we need to enhance our capability to, you know, face the possible risk. And at the same time, certainly we need to you know, work with other country uh, to continue to promote the globalization, to continue to promote the cooperation in the world. And we also need to help other country yeah. to face the challenges of the pandemic. Hope they can also control the pandemic. And uh, for example, to make the vac vaccines available, not only to the Chinese people, but to all the people uh, needed. Professor Lin Yifu, Standing Committee Member of the CPPCC, as always, thank you so much, Professor Lin. You're watching Way Into Sessions, World Inside Special Program. Coming up, China has rapidly adopted a new technology. Now, intellectual property rights are seen as paramount to maintaining this innovation drive. A key Chinese business figure explains. And technology, you need to protect Welcome back. World Inside Special Program, Way Into Sessions. I'm Tian Wei. China makes IPR protection a national strategy. China believes innovation is the primary driving force behind development, and protecting IPR is equal to protecting innovation. Ning Gaoning, chairman of China National Chemical Corporation Limited and member of the CPPCC Standing Committee also voiced out his concerns on IP protection and innovation during this year's two sessions. In a recent interview I had with him, I asked him for solutions. Mr. Ning, tell me more about your yeah. suggestion during this year's two sessions about patent protection. The intellectual property protection has been uh, a, a, a long time issue in China. It became an issue uh, domestically when China tried to um, encourage, promote innovation. So uh, to encourage people to do more investment uh, in research, 
and technology, it's very obvious you need to protect their patent, their uh, 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 event, uh, uh, what they invented. So uh, it's so crucial today uh, because uh, I, I'm uh, taking seeds as example uh, because uh, uh, everybody mm -hmm. knew uh, seeds uh, technology in China uh, has been behind for a long time. And uh, there are many, many thousands, thousands of seeds companies in China. Very few of them got the technology and very few of them uh, spend money or investment or efforts to uh, do discovery type of research. Tell me more about these uh, challenges yes. that Syngenta is facing. Give me some examples. Yeah, uh, you know, Syngenta is a leading global uh, agricultural uh, science company. They're leading in uh, seeds, they're leading in uh, crop protection. Uh, you know, Syngenta spent $1.5 billion every year to do research. And every year, there, mm -hmm. there, mu there must be quite a few new um, uh, crop protection uh, sort of technologies, products, and the seeds, uh, you know, being, being produced by Syngenta. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they are cases in China, like uh, seeds uh, stolen by somebody and copy it and uh, widely use it and even come back uh, mm -hmm. to sue Syngenta, uh, their legal rights. And, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. sort of uh, abuse uh, this uh, uh, system. Because uh, China uh, adopted uh, the new plantation protection sort of uh, agreement, they call UPOA, uh, globally, but uh, with the version of uh, 1971, China needed to, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, improve it or to adopt a new version called 1996 uh, version of uh, seeds protection, uh, crop protection technology agreement globally. So, I mean, there are things behind, there, there are things, uh, so uh, uh, without, without uh, uh, having that, um, you have a kind of a yeah. lot of uh, risk, a lot of challenge when you introduce a new products, new technology mm. in China. Mm. So, Mr. Ning, we all understand that Syngenta is a very interesting case study that the world is paying attention to about how Chinese global company like yours acquire uh, international companies and how they function within the, uh, the context. Uh, so, is this something that you newly learned uh, for example, because of your work uh, with Syngenta, or this has been the issue in your mind because of your other operations uh, in China? Syngenta uh, has been acquired by a Chinese uh, investor for more than two years now. And uh, Syngenta actually mm -hmm. is leading at the market today. In technology, in market share, mm -hmm. it, it became uh, quite a uh, successful case today. Yeah, but this year your proposal of the two sessions of course has a lot to do with uh, what Syngenta is uh, uh, encountering in China, uh, particularly about intellectual property rights and protection. Do you have any specific suggestions as to how to proceed from here? Uh, the two things. One is the law and the standard. Okay, uh, must be very clear and very up updated. Uh, 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 and, and a very uh, uh, international uh, standard. So uh, every, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in not only states, in every aspect of the economy, you know, economy uh, IP, uh, you know, uh, protection has been a major issue when it comes to growing this economy, when the country, uh, you know, invent or invest many things, uh, ma many, many resources into technology. So they, they, that's a must. Has been an issue in China, has been improving a lot uh, in the past few years, but there's still, there, there, there are some things, there are more, more things to be done. Uh, in Xinjiang's case, mm -hmm. I think uh, we needed to uh, uh, upgrade 
our standard from the 1971 version of the agreement to 1996 version of mm -hmm. the global new plantation protection agreement. Okay, uh, so uh, this is something we have to do. Mm -hmm. Then is the enforcement of the law. You know, you got the rules, you got the things in paper, but you need somebody to really seriously, you know, enforce it. Make it a, a really, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a powerful uh, or enforceable, uh, uh, you know, a document. Punish the guys, punish the people who, uh, you know, steal other people's technology. Right. The execution of it. Well, I hope we could all be uh, passionately and also firmly, as you are uh, uh, suggesting, to work on this issue. Let me move on to another one, which is about how businesses these days, especially global companies that are based, uh, headquartered in China, will be able to uh, brave the storm, as they say, amid all the politics and geopolitics. Uh, Mr. Ning, what is your way? You know, I've been busy for many years. You know, I, I know almost every of the major companies in China. Uh, I know most, uh, I know many of them in the U.S., in Europe, in other countries too. Uh, I think, you know, business right. has been sort of a, has been innocent, you know. Uh, business has been, uh, you know, brought into this politics. You know, Sandra Kim, uh has been named as a as a as a as a military company. You know, I I'm confused, I'm puzzled mm -hmm. by this because I don't know why. I I, I think that we are we are uh, you know uh, sort of uh, uh, struggling to uh, to 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 uh, deal with this whole uh, sort of uh, uh, scenario, this environment. And uh, try to explain to everybody, mm. explain to our financier, explain to the, uh, you know, to the to our customer, uh, to our employee, particularly to mm -hmm. our overseas employee, and uh, you know, try to say this is a, this is this is a company, it's a commercial company, is working for its shareholder and working for its um, customer, and we are doing good things for the farmers, for for the consumers. Yeah. I saw you at every year's APEC CEO summit. You were leading this group yeah. of uh, Chinese CEOs, you know, contributing with other CEOs around the world uh, to the political leaders about how you look at the world and how to bring a better world together. I remember two years ago talking to you and you were very passionate about this. You said you and your team were talking to them directly in closed door meetings about how to make things oh, better. Yeah. But now things are not better. I mean, tell me more about how do you look at the reality with all of the great efforts you and others around the world business circle have made, but it seems that it didn't happen. You know, can we say, say our hope is temporary. I hope it's uh, history mm. go into a sort of a wrong direction uh, in a short period, temporary. I hope it can be corrected uh, 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 very quickly. You're watching Way Into Sessions, World Inside special program coming up. We meet someone who has harnessed the new technology to give his pandemic hit business a new lease on life right after this. And travel is a complex product. You know, you need to tell a good story and very efficiently too, because people's time uh -huh. is very precious. This is World Insight, way into sessions. The coronavirus outbreak has dealt a severe blow to global tourism industry, but some industries have boomed, e-commerce for example. E-commerce live streaming rises as a new trend to drive new sales and has created plenty of buzz in China. James Liang Jianzhang, co-founder and executive chairman of Trip.com, China's leading online travel services provider, has changed his business attire and dons a traditional Chinese hanfu to host the live broadcasts, sell travel packages, and hotel room reservations. He successfully generated millions of dollars with his new hobby. 
In my conversation with him, Liang discussed the difficulties in the current tourism industry and his stories of reviving his business through live streaming campaigns. Liang is also a well-known Chinese economist studying on the issue of China's aging population. Let's hear also his analysis about that. You are heading one of the world's uh, most important uh, online booking company. Tell me more about how you survived for the year 2020. I saw your latest number. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, it is a very difficult year for us. And still, uh, the whole global travel industry is still depressed. Uh, but we are hopeful that the COVID uh, uh, pandemic will go away in a year or two. The mass travel already started to recover. Uh, we didn't like uh, other travel companies. So we had a, 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 a cost reduction measure, but uh, we didn't do any large scale layoff. Uh, so we uh, still maintain a strong focus and uh, a very uh, good uh, size uh, the team, in, not just in China team, but also a global team to be prepared for the um, upcoming recovery of the, the pandemic. James, uh, tell me, where are some of the areas you're looking at, uh, you know, for a, a continue to be a difficult year, 2021? Um, the China domestic travel and also, you know, Japan um, and the Korea uh, domestic travel in all the countries. I think they will have, uh, all the countries will have a, a uh, strong recovery uh, for their domestic travel. Everybody is so familiar with your live streaming uh, uh, promotion every week. Uh, we saw you been devoting so much effort into it in different kinds of costumes, as different ethnic groups, you know, even you were even trying to shave off your hair, uh, you know, in order to, to, to be one of those uh, most uh, standing out salesmen of your uh, trip.com. Uh, how did you come up with the idea and why did you still stick to it? I mean, to many business people, this is uh, unimaginable. Oh, yeah, I travel uh, so many different top costumes. And I try to be very mo most efficient in explaining, you know, why people should go to this particular hotel for this particular destination. And for certain destinations, you know, dressing up uh, in the local culture is actually certainly very helpful and also generate a lot of new eyeballs. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and I think the timing is exactly right for this kind of live show because people are yeah. looking for deals uh, and also looking for inspirations because, you know, they're running out of, usually they go to, you know, world famous places, but they cannot go outside of China. And maybe they can only go 300 hundred kilometers away, but within that 300 kilometers, they are looking for um, inspirations. And live show is just the kind of things they are looking for uh, to uh, for deals and yeah. <laughs> uh, for fun too. You know, looking at you know why this uh, crazy boss is dressing <laughs> is dressing dressing up and acting crazy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but I guess you you got you nailed down the nature of this uh, you know online live streaming economy in a way at the very early stage. It seems compared to the others of your peers. Uh, yeah, we are the first, and we're certainly invested heavily. And also, we you know I'm the only. Boss you are the first, <laughs> not just we are office. the first. You are the first. Well, initially, you know, I was kind of. Uh, uh, unaware how this big thing will evolve, and I thought it was just the interview. But as time goes along, I kind of like it. You know, I think there's so much interesting content or interesting stories can be told for those destinations and very good, you know, unique hotels. Um, so it's really a good uh, way of, uh, I think, the uh, very creative way of explaining travel products. And travel is a complex product that you need to um, 
create, you know, you need to tell a good story and very efficiently too, because people's time uh -huh. is very precious. Uh, so you need to, within an hour, you want to have the most efficient way of explaining many products. So best way is actually to have very high quality radio, uh, video and high quality stories. And we invest a lot heavily in, you know, making this uh, 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 live show as high quality as possible. And also our suppliers right. are very eager to participate and willing us to give us very good discount. And you know, especially during this, uh, uh, still a very depressing and uh, especially during the upcoming recovery stage. Mm -hmm. So the timing is very good. So I, I think I'm you know, so very glad that I can be part of this. And this is uh, one of the key innovations in the global travel industry. I think probably other companies especially travel companies will probably follow. This is going to be a challenging year for everyone. We know that for businesses particularly. Now, uh, what do you think will be some of the most important and principal directions you are going to work on to make sure the business survive and even thrive under these very different circumstances? Be, um still very difficult. So domestic travel is actually our focus. I think should be the focus of all the travel companies in the world. And there's a lot to do to even uh, to deep dive on the domestic travel. Uh, in the long run, I think travel industry mm -hmm. will fully recover, including the international travel. So uh, instead of, uh, you know, laying off people, um, you know, try to and reduce cost as much as possible. We keep our international team mostly intact and we continue to invest in our product and technology and content globally. So I think uh, uh, I was telling people that uh, you need to survive, uh, but also you need to be prepared uh, to uh, take advantage of the recovery uh, the domestic travel very mm. in the near, very near future and in the long run, I think the international travel will also fully recover. You've been doing research about China's population, uh, especially the issue about uh, ever slower growth rate of the newborn babies. Tell me what big a challenge is it for China? Well, it's not slow growth. It's actually fast declining new births every year. Uh, the official figure for the full year is not um, announced, but uh, by our best estimates, it's another 15% uh, down from last year, the number of new births. It's, so I think it's a little over 10 million new births this year. Uh, according to my research, China is going to have the lowest fertility rate in the world. Are we going to see a whole generation of, uh, um, you know, uh, slow growth uh, in terms of birth rate in China. What would that mean for the economy? Is China preparing for that possibility right now? You're talking about shrinking the population by half for each generation. So that's a very steep decline. And the overall population will start mm -hmm. to decline uh, in the next few years, much faster than most experts predict. Uh, structure, the age structure of the entire population is getting to be uh, aging very rapidly, uh, that creates a lot of economic problems. Uh, first is, uh, of course, the uh, it creates a heavy burden on the society for carrying the old. Either you have to raise the, the tax significantly or have to raise the retirement age correctly, which is a hot topic today. Both are very burdensome for the economy. This is not just a money issue, really. It is a social issue because you think about the women uh, in China, uh, uh, particularly those of the younger generation, there is a huge demand uh, uh, among them about having a successful uh, career, uh, having a balanced uh, uh, life uh, between work and, uh, and life. Uh, so uh, it is much more than just an, an economic issue. How to make things happen in that way? Yeah, these, these are factors uh, uh, are behind the global reduction of fertility rate. So that's the, the reason that uh, you know, all the developed countries or the industrialized countries are having a rapid declining birth rate. You cannot do much about 
uh, people's uh, lifestyle choices or women's uh, uh, you know career choices. The only thing you can do, just like many other countries, to bribe the woman or you know give heavy uh, financial subsidy to women or families uh, to compensate uh, for their uh, you know reduced or changing uh, persuade them to change the lifestyle. Uh, there's no easy way out. You know, we see the birth rate in China, Japan, and now South Korea have all been on a trend of decreasing. So what does that mean for this part of the world, Northeast Asia, which has been, uh, you know, regarded as one of the most dynamic economies in the world? Well, uh, they are all having the lowest fertility in the world, and they need to solve that. And uh, the lesson to be learned is from uh, the North Scandinavian country, they have a very uh, strong policy intervention to help the family. So their, their financial transfer to families that have more than you know one baby is actually much larger than uh, uh, countries in North Asia, it's like Japan and Korea. So it's something to be learned from. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, uh, there, there are a different uh, trajectory or different stage of uh, declining fertility rate. Japan is uh, still, Japan has the highest fertility rate among all the North East Asia countries, but it's still, uh, it is the earliest country or economy to experience this problem. Uh, Korea will experience this problem fully in the next 10 years and China will uh, experience this problem a generation from now. I see. Another thing is that during the pandemic, uh, it is very clear the uh, fertility rate is going to go down. Uh, the number already shown, for example, for the year 2020. So, uh, James, uh, what would that mean for, you know, really a generation uh, uh, in the world, uh, almost, uh, as we speak? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of experts have different uh, uh, theories about how uh, pandemic will affect the uh, uh, the families uh, having babies, um, I think it will have a slightly depressing effect, uh, but that, I think it's short term. Uh, in the long run, uh, that's mm -hmm. still going to be, uh, uh, especially in North Asia, will have a declining trend. And the people uh, are um, forming a less, uh, a smaller, smaller family. So this is that's something uh, post-pandemic is still uh, going to be uh, the, the driving phenomenon for the, for the global demographics. That's all the time we have for this edition of Way Into Sessions, the special coverage I have for you on the sidelines of China's annual political season. If you want to see more, search World Inside or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of my team at the two sessions and in our studio. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.